Welcome to another very special edition of The Lounge here. Rick Morris, Elaine Tanko, and once again, uh, original dignitary Tim Faust, your dignitaries in residence here tonight. We are foregoing opening statements. We are foregoing this week in the FDH Lounge. We have a very special guest on the phone lines here to start out the program. Uh, and this is, this is going to be an extraordinary segment that we have uh, planned for you here. Uh, this, this gentleman has uh, a story to tell that is uh, nothing short of amazing. Uh, and we have a copy of his book here. Uh, the, uh, the cameras are not uh, yet uh, installed here at our uh, temporary uh, new location at the Promenade at Harpo's. So I, I cannot hold it up to the camera, uh, but uh, I will be uh, discussing it here momentarily. Uh, but this gentleman, the first real gunslinger, I think you would say, at Ohio State, uh, really bridging Woody Hayes and the modern era at that school there, sort of a transitional figure, uh, the first guy really to, uh, to air things out there in a serious way, the all-time passing leader at Ohio State. Uh, went on to have uh, a pro career from there, uh, NFL among other levels that he was at, but the entire uh, football career that he had uh, was plagued by a very uh, significant gambling addiction, and uh, he has quite a story to tell. Uh, this book uh, that he is the author of, Busted, The Rise and Fall of Arch Schleister, uh, you, you can truly say uh, it's a brutal, unflinching look uh, at everything that he went through, unsparing. Uh, th these are all words that you can use to uh, describe this. Uh, the, the honesty just really drips off the pages here. So when he says that he wants to uh, leverage uh, lessons of his life to be able to help other people. I can attest to that. And, and by the way, this was not an instance. We get a lot of instances here where publishing houses send us books. I went out and bought this sucker, so I put my money where my mouth is. It, it's an amazing read. So when I, uh, when I recommend it, uh, I recommend it, uh, you know, for have, having personally made the plunge on this book. It's a tremendous book. We are so happy to have with us here the author of Busted, The Rise and Fall of Arch Schleister. I could only be speaking, of course, of Arch Schleister. Art, welcome to the FDH Lounge on the Sports Talk Network, sir. Good to have you on tonight. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. Well, it's a pleasure uh, to have you, uh, sir. It's, it's really uh, an, an amazing story uh, in this book. One of the anecdotes uh, that, that you, you raise uh, from when you were in college here, it, it's kind of funny because you, you talked about, uh, and we, we talked about in, in the intro here, uh, bridging the era between uh, Woody Hayes and kind of the modern era at Ohio State. Uh, the last game of Woody Hayes, uh, that uh, infamous Gator Bowl there, it, it's, it's kind of funny because when you think back on it, of course, people remember Woody Hayes, people remember Charlie Bauman, people remember that. Uh, even for somebody like me who's been a lifelong fan, you know, I read that in the book like, oh, yeah, that's right, Arch Leister was the quarterback for that. It, it's kind of funny because that's not, it, it's not always commonly remembered who threw the pass, and yet you said in the book that, uh, you know, that, that caused you some, uh, some pain, uh, you know, having that, uh, you know, being, being a part of that, uh, you know, very difficult moment for Woody. Well, every time somebody brings that up and when I'm speaking or traveling around and talking, I always say it. It sends me back into rehab for another year just to try to figure out what happened. But uh, it was a tough time. You know, Coach Hayes was a, a living legend and great football coach. And, you know, I just unfortunate that uh, one night I, I throw an interception and, you know, he uh, strikes another of the, the opposing players and, and loses his job. And, it, you know, it was a tough night for me. It was something I'll never forget. Uh, sad, uh, sad to say the least. And, you know, I had planned on playing for Coach Hayes for four years uh, before he retired, and, and uh, he ended up uh, leaving after one. And so it was a, a big adjustment for me, but certainly a tough night, one that I think about often. As, as things have kind of come out over time here, uh, as as it's emerged about uh, Coach Hayes, you know, having had uh, you know the, the diabetes and and, and the, the turn that his health was kind of already taking, has that kind of helped you to deal with that? As it's kind of come out that I mean, he he probably was pretty much at the end physically, anyways. And that oh, I don't think so. I you know I thought that uh, you know Coach Hayes was a, a tough guy. He was going to be coaching for a while. You know that really you know. Has, has no bearing on how you feel about the the uh, uh, the instance that happened, and you know it was a a tough night for Buckeye fans and Buckeye Nation, and uh, you know one that uh, you know you go on and and remember uh, you know a lot of the great times that happened uh, while I was there, but that was uh, probably the lowest time that I ever had while I was at Ohio State. So uh, you know tough uh, tough tough times. Fair enough. Uh... In, in terms of your career there and, uh, you know, b being one of the first, uh, 
you know, really the first quarterback, I, I'd say, to play in, in, in anything uh, even resembling a, a modern pro-style uh, system there. Uh, you, of course, being the all-time uh, passing leader at, at Ohio State. Uh, what are thoughts that go through your head uh, when you see, and this has probably happened, I think, a few times since you've been there, Terrell Pryor could potentially be on pace uh, to pass you? Should he spend an entire four years there? I mean, you know, do you, do you have any kind of mixed feelings whatsoever about that? Or, you know, or how, how, do, you, how do you view that, uh, given that you were sort of the pioneer of the passing game there? Well, none whatsoever, really, as far as, uh, you know, feeling any... Uh, animosity or, uh, you know, rooting against a guy to, to not break your records. I, you know, my record stood for 30 years. That's a, that's a long time. I, I probably, you know, you go around the country and I, there probably is not one school that, uh, had a quarterback hold the, the total offense record, uh, for the last, you know, for 30 years straight. And so that's, you know, something I'm very proud of and something I was, uh, uh, glad to have done. Obviously, we'd, we hoped that we'd have thrown more when I was in school, and we didn't. But through enough that you know, set some good records, and you know, I'm sure that Terrell is uh, going to be able to break those records. Which uh, you know, he's had a, a, a good career so far, and hopefully, he's going to have a great career before it's all over with and, and win a national championship or two. But I'm um, just always happy to see a high state do well, and uh, you know, pretty amazed that my record uh, actually lasted as long as it did because it. You know, though it was you know a good number of yards. Uh, you look around the, you know the other, other schools around the Big Ten in the country. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot more yardage out there with the passing that they do these days. So, uh, I think it's pretty amazing. It's lasted as long as it did. Very well said. And uh, again, yeah, there's there's no guarantee that it, it won't uh, you know go on into the future. That that could still could very well happen. As far as your time at Ohio State. Uh, give us your thoughts, please, on on playing for Coach Bruce. Uh, he, he's somebody who, again, from the outside, never really seemed to get uh, you know his, his just due from uh, the Ohio State uh, fans in this state. I mean, my, my father's a, a season ticket holder, and you know he, he's a guy where you know where you know he had some impatience with him. I think Woody was obviously a tough act to follow, but even in the end, guys like my dad and other alums could come to see the unfairness of, of how he was uh, viewed back in those days. What, what were your thoughts on that playing for him? Well, you know, Coach Bruce was old school. He was very similar to Coach Hayes in a lot of ways. He believed in in uh, establishing the running game first, and, and the passing game would be a, a complement to it. Where you know, nowadays the passing game is really what they try to establish, and the running game complements your offense. So it's really vice versa compared to what it should be. But um, uh, I, I, you know, I enjoyed playing for Coach Bruce. We had our differences, as I write in the book. Mm-hmm. You know he, you know he was a running coach, and I wanted to pass the ball. So certainly, uh, you know we butted heads a few times, and you know I think it was a, a misunderstood relationship for for a long time. But you know as we've gotten older and later on in life, you know we have become closer, and you know he was a tremendous help for me to come home uh, to get out of prison and and help me uh, kind of get us reestablished in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, but hey, you know he was—he was, you know, he's a good football coach, and uh, and uh, you know it was a tough job uh, following Woody Hayes. Anytime you follow follow a living legend, uh, it's very difficult. But I thought he did a fine job. Yes, what a, what a thankless job, and uh, he he did better than a lot of coaches who followed other legends in, in college football, uh, definitely. Uh, as as far as uh, when you got out of school there, as far as when your uh, your gambling issues first. Uh, emerged when you hit the NFL. It was very interesting because uh, you know you, you you came out into the NFL with great fanfare, and you know you you'd had a tremendous scholastic career behind that. What I found very interesting in the book was the kind of cold-eyed assessment that you made about yourself as a potential NFL quarterback. Uh, you felt. Uh, that you know you, you because of your issues you deprived yourself of maybe a good eight to ten year career maybe a little bit longer than that but uh, it was interesting in the book you didn't have any illusions about necessarily being on the level of an Elway or Moon or anybody like that because of the cannon arms uh, that they thought that they had I thought that was a very interesting assessment. Well, I, you know, I, I think that you know physically I was you know blessed with a great arm and being able to move around and. Um, you know, never missed a game while I was at Ohio State, so I was, uh, you know, I uh, considered myself to, you know, to have some toughness. And, uh, you know, and then being drafted, I, I was so distracted with the gambling 
in my rookie year. You know, it never it never got better. It only got worse. And you know, and, and when you're involved in an addiction and you're struggling with it, and you know, you uh, continue to you know, as a gamblers would do, you continue to lose and lose and lose. You know, it wears on you. Uh, you become depressed, and uh, you know, and then you, you you know you can't be the player that you need to be. You know, you lose your edge. Uh, you know, you become distracted, and that's what happened with me with the gambling, and and uh, it probably cost me a career um, because of it, and it's tough to swallow sometimes. But uh, you know, you know, in the end, you you know, really, what's most important is family, and you know, taking another breath and loving your kids, and you know, enjoying your life, and and that's uh, you know, that's what I've tried to do after football. Absolutely, and uh, I, I, I want to circle this around to you know what I think are some of the redemptive uh, aspects of, of this book because you know you've you've really tried to go out of your way to leverage your story to try to help other people and help them avoid some of these pitfalls. But one of the things that seems to me that probably you know exemplifies you know the issue the the, the most is the fact that you kept going back into it when uh, there were times when you were you were called upon either to turn state's evidence in a case or whatever. Uh, dis- despite whatever danger you were putting yourself in by continuing to associate with anybody taking illegal bets, that still wasn't enough to stop you from doing it. And that's just such a powerful testament right there that, uh, that, that the need to do it was stronger than the fear of some of the, the individuals involved in it. Well, if you, you know, first of all, about the turn of state's evidence, I, uh, you know, that, that was never a, uh, an issue. Uh, you know, I, I laid my bed and I had to lay in it. I got in my own messes and, you know, and, and never had anybody else on my cases and, uh, you know, took my punishment and, mm-hmm. and uh, tried to grow from it. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's been a tough life. You know, you, you had a lot of good things, a lot of, a lot of bad things and, you know, a lot of stuff in between. So you just uh, got to look back and be thankful for you and the breath that you've taken and, you know, with the hope that, you know, you'll be uh, you'll be around tomorrow and, and be able to, to live on. But uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm fortunate. I've had a good family, a good support group, and uh, things have gone well for me since I've been home, and that's uh, that's always a positive. Well, the, the the stories in the book are, are truly incredible about everything uh, that that you went through and the, the times in jail, some of your times out in Vegas. You know, with some of the extreme uh, ups and downs, it seemed like a lot more. Uh, downs and ups. It, it's uh, it, it's it's quite a remarkable uh, tale here. And as I've been saying, uh, you know, we, we urge everybody uh, to read this book. But something, and, and you and I had talked about this briefly off the air, that uh, one of our uh, staff members with the show here has has dealt with gambling addiction himself, and uh, he had sort of independently done some studies on brain chemistry to try to get to a grip on this and you know the same word he mentioned to me is a word that came up in your book from some studies that you've been doing as far as dopamine triggering pleasure centers in the brain and everything and, and that's the thing that I think really just illuminates you know the physical tie into this with brain chemistry here I mean it's it's the same thing that happens to coke addicts or anybody else like that it becomes a brain chemistry uh, issue and you know even if you're you're doing pretty good on willpower and everything like that you have to overcome you know this need that's sort of been hardwired into your body by experience well I certainly agree you know it's uh, um, you know it, it's a it's an insidious disease compulsive gambling it's, it's ruined a lot of people's lives millions of lives and it's probably going to ruin that many more lives or more in the future because of the exposure to gambling and you know I uh, you know, you always ask a question why, and I'm sure there's some physical reasons why. Uh, and and I believe that they they need to set aside some funding so that that they can do more research on why compulsive gamblers uh, have the problem and why they relapse so easily and and why it's so tough uh, uh, to recover uh, and why the people would go to the extremes like I did to continue to make the bet. So it's a uh, it's a baffling illness. It's a insidious an illness and. Uh, uh, it's in the infancy stages. I always say that uh, gambling and the acceptance of compulsive gambling is probably 25 years behind what alcohol is, alcoholism or drug abuse is. So it's uh, it's a very misunderstood disease. Oh, it definitely is. And uh, it, it would seem like uh, medical science, uh, as they're making strides uh, with, with drug addiction towards trying to come up with things to suppress that uh, pleasure center in the brain, it would seem like there would be a lot of applications uh, for that for gambling addicts as well because of 
the similarities. Just another thing I'd like to ask you about, uh, Art, and, and uh, you know, we, we've had uh, we, we've got a fair amount of stuff that we do with our show uh, in the realm of fantasy sports. There, there's been you know, a lot of comparisons drawn, and I think apt ones over the years between fantasy sports and gambling. There is some overlap there. Something like fantasy sports to anybody with it with a gambling addiction, is that something where somebody would be well urged to kind of stay away from that, that it might be kind of like a gateway thing? Or how, how do you view something like that, some of the competitive uh, impulses involved in that? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, when you're compulsive gambling, you need to stay away from all gambling. It's uh, mm-hmm. very tempting and once you get back into it, it's very dangerous. Uh, and I and I do believe that uh, that uh, you know there, uh, the more you hang around it, or if you're exposed to it, the better chance you have to become an addict. And and uh, you know about eight 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 to ten percent of the people become problem gamblers. Uh, the other uh, the lower percentage actually come addicted, but still, you know, in the six or seven percent range. And you know, when you're talking about one every ten people. Uh, walking through a door that might be afflicted by a, 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 not only an insidious disease, but at times a deadly disease because of its suicidal tendencies that people go through when they face the consequences. Um, you know, you're talking about it affecting a lot of people. And, uh, you know, my goal is, is to, to be able to, to bring some exposure to that. And, 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 you know, as we build casinos in Ohio, uh, make sure that the people that are responsible for bringing the gambling to to the forefront and to legalizing it also are taking responsibility for the responsible approach to to uh, to help uh, take care and treat the people that it hurts. And there will be a lot of casualties. Absolutely, there are a lot of social ills that are uh, attached to that. Uh... Uh, Art, uh, as we've been talking about here with your book, Busted the Rise and Fall of Art Schleister, uh, what, what, what a great, uh, very honest uh, book, the way that you've really kind of leveraged your personal experience and, and, and tried to paint a picture, a cautionary tale for other people. We always love to give our guests a chance to uh, plug anything on the show here. I understand also, too, uh, according to uh, Wikipedia, if that's correct, uh, that you have a nonprofit organization, Gambling Prevention Awareness. So anything and everything, Art, uh, please take it away. Well, I mean, you know, we we uh, GPA gambling prevention awareness dot org, um, and you can people can look it up and 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 also uh, uh, give us a, a con- there's contact information if there's anybody out there suffering or has problems with uh, not only gambling but alcohol or drugs and and they need need help. Uh, you know, we can help direct them if there's family members out there that are listening that have a family member they think is an addict or needs. Each help will uh, come in and help intervene and, and try to get them into treatment and uh, give as much information as we can and, and help as we can to, to people and gamblers that are suffering and their families too. Because you know one of the problems is is that not only is the gambling a gambler sick, but his family becomes sick because of all the dysfunctional living that uh, they've been going through. So uh, you know sometimes when you get into the treatment process and you start dealing with families, you find out they're almost as sick as a gambler. So we try to help those people find, uh, you know, a better life and uh, try to uh, keep them going in a positive direction. Well, and, and I tell you what, Dart, we're going we're gonna to link to this uh, on our uh, website. We have a link section here with uh, worthwhile causes. We're going to add that to it, the uh, gamblingpreventionawareness.org. I just have one follow-up question for you uh, based on your answer there, uh, and, and, and that being because you've had, and I think this is to be commended also, you know, you've got a, a very strong you know, religious and spiritual sense that's kind of come out of this. Ha- have you developed the sense as you've gone through your experiences that basically – Everything that you've gone through, this is sort of your purpose in life, that, that you're here, you're in this spot, you've endured all of this, and the people around you have, but you now have the ability to spread the message to other people. Is, is that how you view life these days? Well, I think that, you know, the most enjoyable thing I get out of life is to be able to reach out and, and help somebody that's in need or in trouble or down on the ground and, and needs help back up. And so, you know, as, as we go along and deal with the uh, you know, sick compulsive gambler after sick compulsive gambler. You know, it's it's good to be able to to, to be standing there, giving them a hand, and help them through, and knowing that uh, you know the temptation is still there, and they they still struggle. Well, uh, very well said, Art. And uh, it, again, it's it's a tremendous book, and uh, you're doing a great job of uh, spreading the message. Uh, it was an honor and a pleasure to have you on the program here tonight, sir. I'd love to have you back at any point in time. 
Anytime. I enjoyed it, and uh, and God bless you all. Thank you so much, Art. God bless you also. Uh, Art Schleister, everybody. His book, the Ri- Busted, The Rise and Fall of Art Schleister. And uh, my uh, or- fellow original uh, dignitary, uh, Tim Faust, uh, is here. Uh, he's been uh, kind of taking it all in as we've been going along. So uh, just before we go to our first break here, uh, Tim, uh, thoughts on that? I mean, he had a lot to say and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of very interesting and uh, kind of sobering uh, thoughts, it seemed like to me. Yeah, you, you got to have a lot of respect for <clears throat> for someone who's been down. And when after they're down, they pick themselves back up and say, hey, you know, I, I, not dwell on the fact of what could have been. Um, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, he, he doesn't, you know, look back and say, well, I could have been John Elway or Dan Marino, but the sickness got me. You know what? He, he just seems um, that he's just saying it is what it is and I'm going I can only change uh, things going forward I can't, I can't look back at the past I'm going to count my blessings um, and uh, and be happy with the air that I breathe and, and move on and, and, and you just got to have a lot of respect for somebody like that one of the things I think is very interesting as well uh, another one of our uh, fellow original dignitaries, Nate Noy, good buddy of both of ours. We, we've talked about this on the show previously, and he was the guy that I was referring to uh, during the interview and some of the things he's talked about on the show with his experiences with gambling addiction and dopamine and things like that. I, I thought it was uh, brave of, of Schleister to bring that up in the book as well because that's the kind of thing where, and, and, and he didn't shy away from you know using the word disease and everything like that, I, I thought that was kind of brave also because while you make the conscious choice to start, you know, eventually there are, you know, some physical components of this thing here, and there are a lot of people that are going to take that the wrong way, like your excuse mongering and everything like that. It seems to me that it's kind of brave to speak the truth if somebody fears, that, you know, if, if somebody, I shouldn't say fears, if somebody is going to perceive that as being an excuse, which it's not, but he went ahead and talked about it anyways because he felt like it was important for people to understand that. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's sickness uh, everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and just because it's not a physical sickness um, or, or, or a, a, an outwardly physical sickness is, I, I guess, what you're getting at, mm-hmm. um, it, it, that doesn't mean it's not a sickness. And that's not an excuse. It, it, you know, it is what it is. And, and, and I agree with you. I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's bold. And, um, and, you know, it, it, anyone who, you know, questions that, you know, hasn't lived through or, 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 or isn't, you know, isn't trying to understand hard enough, you know, what, what, what those people actually go through. Exactly. You know what? And there's, there's one more thing I want to bring up before we go to break. I, I didn't have time to get to it with him because uh, we, we'd already kind of pushed him a, a shade past how long I told him it was going to be, and I had to kind of prioritize on that. But I want to get your thoughts on this. This is, this is something that I've noticed. I've known, including Nate, three people in my life, uh, including you know my best friend and, and another uh, good friend of mine as well, who have had the skills, I think, to be professional gamblers. That if they if they merely stuck to systems and and things that their brains could tap into could be professional gamblers. In all three cases, they couldn't stop making bad bets. They couldn't stop because it, they 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 didn't have the detachment. Whether that's the dopamine in that case or whatever. Somebody like me, I'm not a bad gambler. I'm not a great one. I might be like maybe a shade above average, but I'm totally detached. And it's it's funny because my best friend and I we used to have a basketball system, you know, and we we'd both you know bet the thing and. He'd want to get down on one of the late games. And I'd be like, Jeff, we cleaned up today, man. What are you doing? Oh, got to get the action on this. Got to get the action. You know, so it's, it seems to me that's why Vegas is still in business. There's a lot of people that have the skill set, but the people that have the skill set don't have the detachment, it seems like. Well, and, and I think greed is human nature, mm-hmm. and I think that's where greed takes over. And, and any one of us, or, or, or most of us, um, that are in the shoes of, of you know the people who have the skills um, to do that, it, it's very difficult to 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 prevent that that human uh, nature of greed to, to kick in. That you always want more. You always you know uh, if you've got a million dollars, you want a million and one. Um, if you've got a billion dollars, you want a billion and one. Um, and, and, and it's very, very difficult um, for any of us to, to prevent that. Yeah, it really is. And it, it's just it's amazing to me, uh, too, because it, it's something that I've kind of learned 
over time, just, just from observation. Again, as somebody who I don't really have super skills when it comes to gambling, you know, I, I you know, I'm, say I'm fairly decent in some areas of it, uh, but, you know, again, I, I don't have the skills of some of these other guys, but uh, the guys who I know who have the skills just can't walk away when they're ahead, and, you know, that's probably a uh, fatal thing right there.